Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, 85 percent. All right, so we're there. Um, well, I'm glad to be here this morning, and uh, um, I pray that you know what God has has laid upon my heart would um, come forth through me today, you know, truly and um, and and comprehensively to you. So this week. Um, I happened to come across the stories of two baseball players. Now, I don't typically read the sports section. Actually, we stopped reading the Toronto, uh, receiving the Toronto Star. But for some reason, um, you know, one of the mornings, I just went on TorontoStar.com and started reading through some of the articles. And but this this particular week was unique for one of the players, anyways. Um, as some of you know, the the Blue Jays said farewell to Cito Gaston, their manager. Um, Two times, and uh, and he's going to be retiring from the sport. And he was a decent player in his time. He made it to the All Star team one year, but he was a great manager, a decent player. But he was a great manager. And what made him great was that he focused on the players to bring out the potential out of each of them. He didn't think too much. I mean, of, of course, he wanted to win. He wanted to create a winning team, but he was more focused on drawing out the best from each player. But what also made him great is that he didn't let his circumstances hold him back. When he first came into, into baseball, or well, actually when he first came into the major leagues in the late 60s, um, it was a time when racial tensions were very high. And for those of you don't, who don't know Cito Gaston, he's African American. Um, but he never let that slow him down. And he actually even took under his wing um, a, another African American player who's younger than him, who was, you know, having a really tough time dealing with the the slurs that were thrown to him throughout um, from the stands and just the overall oppression and persecution from his teammates. And now Cito Gaston is known as the first American, Amer sorry, African American manager to have uh, brought a team to the World Championship World Championship Series and won it. And not only that, he's done it twice. And not only that, it was two years in a row. No one else can, can boast that. And that's incredible. And the other player I happen to read about is Jose Canseco. See, Jose Canseco, uh, when, he was, when he was a player, he had an incredible talent for both strength and speed. Now, most, um, most baseball players, if they are really good, you know, they're either, they either have a lot of strength and they would hit, say, 30 to 40 home runs um, within a year, or they'd be really fast, and they would steal about, say, 30 to 40 bases within a year. I uh, hope those numbers are somewhat correct anyways. Um, but, you know, it's, it's difficult to reach high numbers for either of those. Jose Canseco was able to do both in one year. That's rare. And in his time, you know, he was, he was, he was a great, great player, a rare player. But during his career, he was struggling with anger issues. You know, we hear reports of domestic abuse. And after his career, he struggled and he continues to struggle to maintain his fame by pulling publicity stunts. And he tried so hard that, you know, nowadays he's somewhat of a joke among the sports circles. Nobody really remembers, I mean, well, people do remember what he's done, but they remember him more for his publicity stunts and what kind of a, what, what a joke he is. So all that reputation he had He's built up, it's, it's done nothing for him. And what I find similar about these two men is that each of them were held back by something. Cito Gaston was an African-American man playing in a predominantly Caucasian sport. And never mind the struggles I'm sure he faced in society just every day. Jose Canseco was held back by his anger issues and his desire to cling to fame and great reputation. And the difference is that Cito Gaston chose to look beyond himself to other people, and Jose Canseco rema uh, remained and continues to remain focused on himself. And they remind me of the two men um, in the Bible that we're looking at today. We've been going through the book of 1 Samuel over the last few months, which feature the lives of the first two kings of Israel, two men who had the potential to become great, and they did become great, but while one continued, to, continued on to be remembered as the greatest king of Israel, the other spiraled down into a tragic and depressing death. Today I want to explore the story of redemption in the lives of David and Saul, how God brought them out of obscurity, established with them a new and more intim intimate relationship with each of them, and the responses that David and Saul 
had with this new relationship with Yahweh. I want us to take a look at how God calls each of them to partner with him. And yet Saul refuses redemption from the mistakes he's made because he was so focused on himself. While, um, while David looks beyond himself to God, even though he's being persecuted by God, uh, sorry, he's being persecuted by Saul, by Saul, and as a result, he continues to live a, re a life redeemed by God. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30 and 31. And we'll just read through those verses again to refresh our memory of, of what happened. And I'm not going to go through the, the entire chapters, but um, you know, as, as Catherine read earlier, we're just going to focus on the, the beginnings of each chapter. So in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 7, it says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the woman and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Echanoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 31, um, verse 1, we'll continue on to verse 6 as well. So 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1 to 6. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor-bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men died together that same day. So based on these verses alone, we can see the differences in these two lives of the kings of Israel. David is given hope to gain back what was lost, and he remains in favor with God. Saul has lost all hope, and he has lost God's favor, driving him to suicide. But each of them had started off on solid spiritual ground, what happened? Well, let's look back at the beginning of their stories. And most of us are familiar with David's calling and, and his anointing. He was the youngest son of Jesse from the tribe of Judah. He was a shepherd boy who wasn't expected to do anything great except maintain the family business. Even the prophet Samuel doubted his use when he first saw David. God, however, says that he looks at the heart. And we see the strength of this heart displayed when David goes up against Goliath, the Philistine giant, when everyone in Saul's army was too afraid to do so. And we see this heart displayed when he boldly goes to save Caleb with a rabble army, simply on God's word, and when he spares Saul's life twice. Each time his heart was turned towards God. But did Saul have this heart then? And one might argue that Saul didn't have the same resources to work with as David did. You know, but if we look at 1 Samuel 10, we see that God invested in Saul. So in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, it says, As Saul turned to leave Samuel, this is right after uh, Samuel had anointed him king. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gebeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in the prophesying. 
I like how the, the ESV translates it. It says actually that God gave Saul a new heart. Not to say that his old one was horrible, but God knew that the king of Israel needed something more. And God gave him a new heart. God equipped him. God invested in him. And we also see in chapter 11 what happens when Saul hears about an enemy threat to the people in the city of Jabesh. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power and he burned with anger. And afterwards we see how he gathers people all around to save the city of Jabesh. The Spirit of God was with him. God changed Saul's heart to be one which is more sensitive to his spirit. Saul, God gave Saul a taste of what it's, be like to, what it's like to be in greater fellowship with him and to work in partnership with him. And one could say that he actually had a greater experience than David did as he was anointed king. David didn't experience any of these things. He went back to the fields. He went back to, to his sheep and, 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 the, um, and the pastures. Sorry, brain freeze right there. He went back to the pastures. You know, Saul is overcome with God's spirit. He prophecies. And he leads people mightily into battle. David, he's persecuted by his best friend's father, who happens to be his father-in-law, who happens to be the king of Israel. But it doesn't matter so much how they came into greater fellowship with God. What matters is what they did as a result of being in God's presence. Time after time, David turns toward God and what God has taught him, especially when he's hard-pressed on every side. Saul, on the other hand, reacts to the situation around him and tries to take control as much as he can, but to no avail. In chapter 13, Saul's army begins to scatter after de defeating the Philistines because Samuel was late in, in, um, to arrive to perform the sacrifice. So, so Saul takes control and he performs the sacrifice himself. Now we might think, there's no harm in that. The sacrifice was done. Something needed to be done to, to worship God after, after great, a great victory. But the problem was that he stepped into the role of the prophet. He was assuming leadership in an area which God didn't grant him. In chapter 15, we see Saul giving mercy to the Kenites and to the king of the Amalekites and enjoying the spoils of war. And we might think, well, what's wrong with that? He was victorious and he gave mercy to other people. But God had instructed him to wipe out everyone in the city and everything in it, and not to enjoy the spoils of war. No one was to be spared, and nothing was to be kept. But Saul did both. And with these instances in chapters 13 and 15, Saul directly disobeyed God and tried to take matters into his own hands instead. And in coming to the end of 1 Samuel, we're not surprised to see that David rises back to favor with his people and is continued to be blessed by God or to see Saul devastated in the battle and then, and then killing himself. And is this the only way that Saul's legacy could have ended? I don't think so. I think that he still had a chance on that battlefield as he lay mortally wounded. Well, he still had a chance to repent and turn to God. And some might ask, well, what about chapter 28? You know, didn't Saul try to inquire of God before going to the Witch of Endor? Didn't he try to come back to God then? And what the writer of 1 Samuel wants us to recognize is that, yes, Saul did inquire of God, but Saul didn't repent. And those are two different things. Nowhere does he bring himself to his knees. Nowhere does he confess the wrongdoings of his past. And nowhere does he subject himself to God's mercy. He's not concerned about his fellowship with God. What he is concerned about is whether he will live or die. In chapter 31, we see Saul's misaligned priorities. In verse 4, his concern is about being tortured by his enemies. And, and that's a valid concern, as we see later on. Even though you know, he's, he's already killed himself, he's dead, the Philistines still take him on, and they abuse his body, they decapitate him, and they put his dead body on for show. So he was right to be concerned. However, his greater concern, concern should be about being in a right relationship with God. He's going to die soon anyway. He was mortally wounded. But his soul will live on forever. And where will it be? With God or without God? After all this upheaval, he couldn't own up to the fact that it started when he turned away from God and turned instead to himself. He had one more chance 
to repent before God with his last breaths, but instead he used them to end his life in disquiet rather than peace. And David is in a similar situation of despair. He's not wounded in battle, but he's coming back from a war, weary, from, uh, weary with 600 men, and only to find that everything that they're looking forward to is gone. Their homes, their possessions, their families. And as a leader, David is doubly pressed. He's lost just as much as his men, but now they're talking of killing him. They loved him and followed him anywhere and everywhere, and now they're thinking, we don't want anything to do with this leader. He's brought us to ruin. Let's kill him. And as a leader, he could have just, or sorry, he could have just walked there and run away from his army. I mean, when we read through the Psalms, we know that David is quite an emotional person, and he could have just dwelled in his emotions instead of, of, of doing something about it. Instead, he puts his grief aside, and he turns to God. He takes intentional action. He calls upon the priest Abiathar, puts on the clothing of spiritual leadership, and calmly goes before God. And I'm sure if he did cry out to God in the midst of his grief, you know, he didn't have to take the ifad. He didn't have to, to come towards God calmly. God would have answered if, God's, if David's heart was turned towards him. But David took his responsibility as a spiritual leader amongst his army, amongst his people, seriously. And more importantly, he took his relationship with God seriously. And so what about us? As some of you may know, I'm a bit bugged when it comes to talking about David. And don't get me wrong, um, you know, he's a great follower of God. I love David. But um, sometimes we forget that he's just a human being, just like the rest of us. And you know, he struggled. He had his moments of failure. And you will, we'll read more about that in 2 Samuel. He wasn't perfect. And when I bring up David as an example for people to follow, it seems like I'm setting up this unreachable standard because we remember everything great he did, and he did so many great things. How are we to be as faithful as David? How are we, how are we to have a heart um, after God's own heart as David did? And on the flip side, we have Saul. You know, as tragically as his life turned out, we need to remember that he was anointed by God for a reason. God thought him worthy enough to be the first king of Israel. But when we talk about King Saul, we usually focus on all the wrongs he did. And don't get me wrong, there were many of them. You know, as, we, as we'd seen in 1 Samuel, just like David did many things right in the eyes of God. What we need to remember is that these two men are examples. And they're two examples amongst many in the Bible. They've done both right and they've done wrong. And they all fall behind the only one who was ever perfect and is ever perfect, Jesus Christ. So what we can do is look at their lives, learn from their mistakes or their good choices. What we can do is observe how David partnered with God to create a, a wonderful story of redemption and how Saul rejected God to choose his own path in controlling events beyond his control. What we can do is ask ourselves, how can we also have a great redemptive story to tell? How can we, at the end of our days, leave behind a legacy which tells of the greatness of God in our lives? How can we live a life rich with God's fingerprints and handiwork? How can we partner with God? We need to turn to God. That's the most important thing. That's the first thing. This is something that David understood to be integral in his life. David lived a life focused on God. It wasn't perfect, but it was focused. Saul ended a life focused on and bound to himself. He turned to God, but with his head only, not his heart, meaning that he went through the rituals of sacrifice, of prayer, but he didn't truly commit himself to, the rit to who the rituals pointed to. It was like he was talking to God, but facing the other direction. So imagine if, you know, let's say, okay, let's say God is over here, and I'm Saul. It's almost like Saul's facing this way and asking God questions over his shoulder, hoping that God hears him, hoping that God says something back. But he's not facing him at all. He's still focused on what he wants to do. He's not truly turning himself toward God to see what God wants him to do. David understood that turning means repentance. 
And only in repentance to God can redemption be found. And in fact, the Hebrew word to repent, shuv, means to turn around. And not just a half turn, so turn, but a full about face. And this is why David's inquiries to God were ceremonial, even on the run. Ordered that he did so after saving Kayla in 1 Samuel chapter 23. Um, in verse, when David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod. And again, in today's passage, chapter 30, verse 7, it says, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake? Some of you may remember from an earlier sermon in the series that an ephod linen worn by priests, and one which David has, um, and the one which David has is worn by the high priest, so it's uh, more greatly decorated. Um, and it's most likely from the high priest at Nob, whom Saul, who, whom Saul had killed in chapter 22. And David wore this not because he was spiritually promoting himself, but because this item helped him fully turn towards God. It's the same as some of us who may have a quiet corner for our devotions, or for, for others, the cross necklace we wear, or whatever it might be. Even on the run, especially on the run, David wanted to ground himself in God and make sure he was fully turned towards him. So what do you have that keeps you turned to God? Is it a verse that you keep in your wallet? Or a picture you hang up at work or keep on your phone? Is it a plaque that you keep up above your doorway at home? There's always going to be something in life that tries to turn us away from God. And we need to keep turning ourselves back to God. And the things which do turn our hearts um, and our heads, you know, they, they aren't bad things. They're just things that aren't God. You know, they could be our hobbies. We all love our hobbies. You know, Benny has hockey. I have makeup and, and nail polish. Okay, and, and some of you might have some other sports. Um, you might have video gaming. You might have reading. You might have cooking. You might have eating. You might have watching movies, playing board games. And none of these are bad. But if they take our focus off of God and what he wants for our lives, we have allowed them to become something bad. You know, we may not be as extreme as, you know, the, the, the various young men who've died over the decade um, because they, they played 24 hours plus of a computer game. You know, they died of exhaustion. They couldn't get themselves away. But we need to remember that these young men didn't start off with half-day binges. They started off slow. It's a time that we give to our hobbies, our career, even our family and friends may slowly increase to the point where we forget or we might not even hear what God is saying to us because we're turned away. Saul didn't begin as a jealous, of his throne kind of a king. But he started with something seemingly harmless, such as performing the sacrifice after his first battle with the Philistines. And it started this distance between him and God and that's why Samuel reacted so greatly against him. Really, he saw the beginnings of the slippery slope down. So what can we do to keep ourselves turned to God? How do we shuv? How do we repent so we can live out the redemptive story God has intended for each and every one of us? And now some of you might be thinking, you know, repent. That's quite a hard word. You know, we're just talking about hobbies, career. Isn't repentance from sin? You know, when we do bad things? But we must remember that to sin means to miss the mark. And for us, it means to miss the mark that God has set for us. And that mark is to be like Christ. Sin isn't about being morally or ethically correct, even though both of these aspects involved in following after God. It's about not obeying God. And, when we, can't, and we can't obey him if we're turning away from him. If we aren't fully facing him you know, with our face, we're bound to miss the mark. In Greek, um, the word for repentance is metanoia, which means to change your mind. You can't change your mind if you're always looking at the same thing. You can't change your mind for God if you're not looking at God. Now, maybe some of you don't view your situation to be that, that bad right now. One day, you know, we'll come across a crossroad, but something in our lives, just like David and Saul. And I'm sure Saul didn't think it would be this bad. You know, all he did was perform a sacrifice. 
And yet when it came to the ultimate crossroad, his death turned to God. He was still bound to himself. And I encourage all of us not to wait until a situation in our life has become so despairing that we may be too lost and, and forget to turn to God. Do so now so that we can live out the, full, the fulfilled life, the redeemed life which God wants us all to have. And, you know, we can only wonder how, how different Saul's story may have been if he repented or even after um, you know, taking the, the spoils from war. When we continue into 2 Samuel, we'll see other mistakes, again, that David's made. And while he still lives with the consequences, God has grace upon him when he repents. You know, it's really too missed out on experiencing grace from God, simply because he refused to turn to him. So back to how we can keep ourselves turned to God so we can experience his grace and see, his, uh, see our own redemptive story unfold. It all boils down to spending time with God. It's something we talk about all the time. Do your devotions. Come to fellowship. Come worship with us. Come to the Thanksgiving service on Friday. Serve in church. You know, join us and join one of our outreach initiatives. But it's these activities which help us keep turning towards God and, and help us to remember him in the midst of everything else that's competing for our lives, especially these days. And I'm not saying that we need to throw out everything else in our life, that we need to, con to constantly reflect on what we have put as, a pro as we commune with God so that we can see what he wants us to put. You know, if I, if I didn't think family was important, I'd be going on maternity leave. But while I'm on maternity leave, I need to remember that God is still my priority. Maccabee.